someone sees a clown and they're like, oh, a clown. Oh, hey, clown. How are you? Next thing you know, you're ripping out their underwear and, you know, and but it's all okay. <laughs> That's a clown sexually assaulting somebody. That's pretty funny. Yeah, Clowning yeah. is a is a very easy way to get people riled up. See the funny little clown, he's hiding behind a smile. They all think he's laughing, but I know he's really crying all the while. Ten years ago. I'd never given clowning much thought. I was a stand-up comedian, and the world of red-nosed men falling over had nothing to teach me, or so I thought. But in 1996, I was researching a novel set in Arizona, and I came across a short description of the clowns of the Pueblo Indians. Now, for the Pueblo clowns, the comedy of shark offence and outrage seemed to have a social, moral, even a spiritual purpose in a tradition that went back hundreds, possibly thousands of years. For ten years I've wanted to see if I was right when I suspected that the clowns of the Pueblos might be a key to understanding the nature of clowning and by association the purpose of humour in the widest possible sense. The trail of oversized footprints that led to Taos Pueblo made a final detour to the Santa Monica hotel room where I interviewed another clown who wasn't scared to confront. Michael Perrick, alias Fucko the Clown, is a scary street performer from Los Angeles who assaults his audience uh, physically as well as emotionally uh, and orchestrates mass clown actions and clown sex parties on a grand scale that are sometimes obscene, sometimes playful, but always look worthwhile from the photos. One guy actually um, was, was so upset with me, he actually pissed on me. My, I was with one of my uh, performers and, and she's like, oh my God, and next thing I know this guy is like, pissing on my arm because he was standing on a, on a car near me. He stood on a car. He had to get above you. He had to get a pit yeah, above yeah. me because he had to pee down on me. Did you feel that that was an indication that you'd succeeded or that you'd failed? I Actually, I wasn't really upset about it. I really wasn't. It was like I had provoked this guy so badly to well, it's a point yeah. it had worked. You know, obviously he thought that he had triumphed. He had, mm. he had done something to me, but I was just like, ah, oh, whatever. <laughs> you know? You know, it was just, and I, I didn't even wash up. I let it dry on my on my outfit. Yeah, which of course is what the character would do. But exactly. you yourself probably wouldn't do that. No, I normally would not have done that. As a clown, big deal. I'm sitting in uh, an adobe style motel on the edge of Highway 518 in Taos, New Mexico, uh, where I've come to finally see a bit of Pueblo Indian clowning, hopefully after 10 years of reading about it and being mildly obsessed with it. That's quite a big deal for me. I remember I would hide behind my mom's skirt and she would like, like, like grab, get me like, don't worry, you know, don't worry. They're not going to do nothing, and they grabbed my little brother and they threw him in the river. There was a character that was uh, going around and basically laughing at people and throwing things at them almost. They won't allow cameras of any kind, and they won't allow cell phones because the cell phones have cameras. Mm. And if they confiscate yours, you will not get it back. A lot of uh, what I remember is, uh, is hallucinations and then waking up in the backseat of a car in my puddle of my own drool. So. Right. <laughs> Well, that's a success then for the <laughs> They are the finest piece of theater in northern New Mexico. There's lots of different groups of Pueblo Indians in the southwestern states, um, and they're, they've all got a broadly similar culture, but lots of specific differences. Uh, the word Pueblo derives from the architecture, you know, that kind of adobe housing sort of stacked up in levels around um, a kind of public plaza. But I'm in the northern part of the state because I'm going to go to Taos Pueblo to try and see the clowns of the Tewa. But it's hard to find out anything about the clowns or what I can expect to see in the Pueblo tomorrow afternoon. Most of the descriptions of the performances are from anthropologists over a hundred years ago. There's no photos apart from kind of sepia tinge ones from the turn of the century. No one wants to tell you anything about it. Uh, you can't get anyone on the phone from a, the, the tourist office or the Pueblo. I mean, there, there are some recordings available of 
kind of non-sacred music, but on the whole, nothing. In fact, yesterday I was in a bookshop here in Taos, and I, I said to the woman behind the counter, who I think was a Tiwa Indian, I said, have you got any books on the San Jeronimo Day Festival? And she just went, no, there aren't any. It's our most sacred day. There is no books on it. And I felt like I'd caused offence inadvertently. But this San Jeronimo Day Festival is one of the few opportunities left to see the Pueblo clans in action. Um, and this morning at the little motel I'm staying in, I got talking to the maid, uh, who's called Daphne Mondragon, and she's been going to it since she was a child. So, when did you first go to the festival at the When I was Pueblo? about a little girl, a very young little girl, like about seven, eight years old. What I remember, when my mom took us, they would, they would like dress up. They would put like a, they would put, like paint on their faces. The, the clowns. The clowns, yeah. but they're called chupinetes. Right. Just looking at them, I remember I would hide behind my mom's skirt, and she was like, she would, like, like grab, get me, like don't worry, you know, don't worry, they're not gonna do nothing. And they grabbed my little brother and they threw him in the river. <laughs> That's that was their tradition. You know, yeah. I don't know if they still do it today, but I right. remember them doing that. But anyways, as the story continues. They had two big, long, 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 like telephone poles. And they had a sheep in each pole. And each one of these chupinetes had to climb to see who would get, who would get there before the other. And they had to untie him, and whoever bring him down would win. And they, 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 they couldn't climb with, with ropes. They couldn't climb with, you know how they could, you could put stacks. Yeah, yeah. They had to climb with their, themselves. So what, what did the clowns look like? You couldn't tell who they were. Right. They were just really um, painted, did that painted on. Did that make them frightening that you couldn't tell who they yes. were? Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, especially to a little girl. Right. <laughs> there were dozens of different subclasses of Pueblo clowns, and when I was at the Hopi villages six years ago, um, I bought a little wooden doll, they call them kachinas, um, of a mudhead clown who looks like a kind of clay-faced pig. Um, but the main type of Pueblo clown is the Kishare, and that's probably what we'll see tomorrow. W when you read descriptions of the clowns from the 1800s, it's really amazing the stuff that's going on. There's people running around kind of simulating copulation and big bowls of urine being flung around at people and drunk, and, and it's really kind of full on. And obviously this is why these performances got stamped on by the white authorities in, in the 1800s. Um, but more recent studies have suggested that even these performances had a moral, possibly even sacred function. And, and they often happened alongside more obviously devout religious ceremonies. Susan Bockrook, she's working here in the Moby Dickens bookshop in Taos. Uh, she's been to San Geronimo Day many times. You never approach one. I've never seen either a native or uh, an Anglo approach them in a personal fashion, ask them a question or anything of that sort. They're very forbidding and they're very funny. And there was an old, old woman sitting with a shawl around her shoulders on the bank of the river. And she was watching the whole scene. And this clown came down and he put his arm around her shoulder and he whispered in her ear obviously something that was quite personal and she put both of her hands over her mouth and giggled out of control so he that was just food for the for the feast hmm. and she went he went over and got a uh, another chair and came down and sat right beside her and snuggled with her and continued whispering in her ear and she was laughing uncontrollably. <laughs> and that's my favorite story about the Kosharis. And uh, can you just tell us what they look like? What kind of costumes they're in? Oh my! They're painted black and white with, with large stripes, maybe nine inches uh, across and across their arms and they have usually a loincloth on and they have corn husks tied above their ears and a lot of makeup on their faces. And as with, I think, most really good clowns, they become the clown. They lose their own identity 
and become the Kosharis. They also snatch children from their mothers and put them in the river. They're not going to hurt them. They just scare the hell out of them. But that's an interesting thing to watch. And so the young boys will tease them in spite of what everyone says to all young boys. Do not tease the clowns. They just have to. I'm sure you understand how that is. Yes, yeah, so I won't tease the clowns. Well, yes. I don't want to get thrown in the water. <laughs> I, need to be, uh, I need to be there to observe. But you don't have to go to the middle of a desert, to the oldest settlement in the American continent, to find a clown that thinks he has a sacred purpose. Um, I'm putting a dog collar on. Here's one in a small parish church in Seven Oaks, Kent. Being both a clown and a priest, I've always worn a dog collar as part of my costume, but it's all-fitting, because like most clowns, nothing quite fits, so it kind of hangs a bit loose, which seems to be appropriate. Half collar, half fallen halo. The Pueblo Indians don't believe there's anything wrong with having clowns at religious ceremonies, and Rowley Bain is a British vicar who agrees with them. When he was at Theological College in the 70s, he wrote a thesis about the idea of Jesus as a clown. Uh, and then he went to clown school. And now he performs as a clown in churches, prisons, hospitals, and at religious ceremonies. I mean, I've custard pie ten bishops. Because oh, right. you have to bring the mighty down from their seat. <laughs> First one was Jim Thompson, who was a lovely guy. It was a clergy conference, and uh, it was all to the quiz. He's got to answer ten easy questions, but the last one... Uh, is what is Matthew 5, verse 39. The answer is turn the other cheek. <laughs> but he gets a custard pie on a f to get a clue, and then he yeah. gets the other one. But when we did Michael Nazir Ali, who's the Bishop of Rochester, he went up in the estimation of most of the clergy in his diocese because they'd suddenly seen that he could play, that he wasn't quite the remote ac academic they'd assumed that he was. Um, every time I see him now, he makes a huge sign of the cross to kind of keep me away. To protect himself from <laughs> yeah. the vampire it's clown. Right. But yeah. I mean, he loved it, and, 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 and his whole diocese loved it. And I dare to suggest that the diocese was changed because of that conference and because this idiot was there. The diocese because, was changed? Yeah. yeah. What had been a very traditional and stuffy conservative diocese, it probably still is, uh, was certainly changed over those few days, and people were grateful for that. So presumably you, you see a connection between the vicar and the clown and between Jesus even because all those people uh, try and tell us things about society by, well, by showing what would go wrong if we didn't follow the rules. Yeah, there's a whole prophetic bit about, uh, about the clown and, of course, of Jesus because he turns everything upside down so you can see it the, 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 the right way up. But I also think he had a huge sense of humour that we've lost sight of and all his storytelling and his punchlines mm. were what amazed people and surprised them because you can begin to tell the truth. I mean, the clown is the jester, the truth-teller, and the Christian claim is that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So it's the kind of the truth-teller bit is one of my models of the clown. So a bishop's queuing up to be custard pied by you now, hoping it will have the same transformative effect well, you on have their to, relationship with their public. You have to be careful with your bishops. You have <laughs> yeah. to, you know, like all these things, clowns can only play with people who want to play, and then some bishops can't play. So you can't play with them. Because even, even though you're custard buying somebody, they aren't victims, they have to play with you. We walked into uh, an office building in downtown Los Angeles, about ten of us. Dressed as clowns? As clowns. Yeah. And we get into the lobby, the receptionist is there, or, should, or I can't say reception, lobby ambassador mm. was there. And uh, <laughs> we're like, we're here for John's birthday! You know, just give out a name. Oh, but they're all in a meeting. Well, that's okay. And we went right into the board meeting of all the men in suits. There was about 50 people in there with suits. And we're just going, we're here for John's birthday. They all point to one guy and, you know, the girls are taking off their tops. They're, you know, giving him lap dances. We're stealing the donuts. And then I, I started, like, making drawings with the coffee. And, and they're like, uh, the guy's like, it's not my birthday. <laughs> and we say... Oh, well, is this the so-and-so company? And they're like, no, that's on floor. Because we looked at the register, and they're like, that's yeah. on floor eight. Oh, sorry! Yeah. So we go to floor eight. We did about six, six, seven floors before you finally got kicked out of the building. And it's... And presumably there's no, there's no financial gain in this. There's no point in it other than a sense of chaos. No, most of us are rather poor. Mm. <laughs> so what was the... At the planning stages, what was the incentive behind this clown action? Uh, it was, hey, let's dress up like clowns and go into an office building. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that's enough, isn't that it? That was enough. It was yeah. just all us weirdos going, yeah, that's a great way to spend a Monday afternoon. <laughs>
Michael Perrick, our confrontational Californian clown. Now, Michael first saw Pueblo clowns at the Zuni Pueblo um, during a ritual involving hallucinogenic cacti, which he was somehow allowed to attend as the honoured guest of a local doctor when he was only 14 years old. And quite frankly, I don't think he should have been. There was a character that was uh, going around and basically laughing at people and, and, th and throwing things at them almost. Uh, but a lot of uh, what I remember is hallucinations and then waking up in the backseat of a car in my puddle of my own drool. So. Right. <laughs> so this clown in this situation was happening alongside what is basically a sort of a religious ceremony. Yes. And um, they didn't feel that that was inappropriate to have the, the serious ceremony being mocked simultaneously. No, not at all, because those are, those are parts of reality. The whole idea is that there's a seriousness of your life things that have to be done, such as eating, drinking, you know, social mores. But then there's also the things that you do not need to take so seriously. You need to be able to step outside yourself and say, yeah, that was pretty stupid. You need to be able to laugh at yourself and inside. The, and the clown being there helps that to happen. Definitely. So I'm digging around for odd props. Uh, some camel cigarettes for doing the camel through the eye of a needle. Some balloons for putting needles through. When you're doing Christian clowning, are you a clown first and a vicar second, or the other way around? Um, probably both together. Right. <laughs> <laughs> in a sense, I mean, all my material has some Christian story, some content, but I think actually the clown, in a sense, is the most important thing because that's, that's the mysterious figure that everyone connects with, which is why every age, every culture has had its clowns, its fools, because they're the wise ones. Um, oh, now, where's that gone? Further with any luck is under here somewhere, because that's for the Archangel Gabriel. <laughs> um, all will be revealed in due course. Uh, but there's, I think there's a simplicity and an innocence of the clown that allows them to tell the story in such a way that people can recognise it, the truth of it for themselves. And I think when Jesus came along, he, in a sense, did the same thing, which is why Jesus as clown works as a model because instead of all the high and mighty scribes and Pharisees, along came this idiot who was prepared to die on a cross and it was accused of being a drunkard and a friend of sinners who told great tales with great punchlines. It was good fun to be with. And that isn't the model that most people think of as religious people. No. Peacemakers, bike, slack. Oh. Yes, I've got everything. They usually start five minutes late with these things to allow the audience, if there are any, to get here. So it's Saturday morning and we're just on our way up to Taos Pueblo to see the clowns. Uh, the locals have told us they'll come out at about one o'clock. All the local literature says, do not make eye contact with a clown. Do not ask anyone at uh, the Towers Pueblo any direct questions about their lifestyle, beliefs or culture. Uh, if you are welcomed into their houses, do not introduce yourselves to them as this is considered rude. Wait a reasonable amount of time before doing so. Um, if the clowns pick on you, be sure to participate and act like a good sport. But do not join in uninvited. Uh, be wary about applauding anything as it's the equivalent of applauding a mass because this is a religious ceremony rather than a performance. It seems like a cultural nightmare. You're not allowed to take recording equipment in or cameras. You can't even take phones in now because of all the technology. Uh, I don't know what it'll be like. I mean, it could be terrible, which would be a shame after ten years of waiting. See you on the other side. See the funny little clown He's hiding behind the smile Can I try a trick? Can I try a trick? Yeah. Oh, thank you. A perfectly old piece of newspaper. We call the Church Times, Lord the newspaper. We're going to try and make it disappear, to vanish before your very eyes. Somebody should. <laughs> we turn it in half. Two pieces. All you see, I am that funny little clown. Right, I've just got uh, back in the car after the Taos Pueblo San Jeronimo Day 
clown performance, which was everything you could hope for and more. Um, I got there about half an hour before it started and walked around the Pueblo, which was kind of lots of uh, buildings that kind of go up in steps either side of a big plaza with a little river running through it. And then just a little bit after one o'clock, there was this kind of crowing, screeching noise. And then on the roof of the highest buildings overlooking the plaza, the ten clowns came up in striped black and white paint with their hair tied up in bunches with kind of big clumps of corn sheaves attached to their heads and different coloured kind of loincloths on and they were silhouetted against this bright blue sky making these unearthly kind of screaming noises that w it was more frightening than anything and you were really worried about when they were going to come down into the Pueblo what was going to happen and gradually they made their way down off the um, over the kind of steps of the buildings and ended up in the square and began to harass people and then they kept grabbing small children in a really scary way that made all the children cry and running to the river and throwing them in this river that was about a foot deep and kids were all right but they didn't enjoy it <laughs> and it was really it was very funny seeing frightened children um, and then they cornered a very fat man on a very narrow bridge crossing the river and attempted to push him off gradually more and more clowns tried to push him until they had to admit that it wasn't possible and went for a less fat but still fat man and just pushed him off the bridge into the water. You didn't have to be looking at the clowns to feel their presence in the plaza. You could, you could sense that in another area of the village something frightening and mad and hilarious was happening. There was always this palpable sense that anything could kick off at any point. Somehow the clowns managed to cultivate an authority which meant that they could kind of collectively push through groups of people and force people to do what they want and, um, and keep the day moving. And I think it's because they just genuinely were quite frightening. I was standing watching something else and one came up behind me and shouted something in Tewa, I think, to move. And I, I just jumped out of the way really obediently. Um, the last thing I wanted to do was to interact with them. I was terrified that something was going to happen. When they step over the roof of those buildings and come into view, they fully inhabit those characters. They fully inhabit the ideas of being these kind of mischief makers, these dangerous goblins, giving them a license to do anything without any sense of embarrassment or fear. It was everything I could have hoped for, and um, um, hopefully there'll be some people around that can help us make more sense of it. But if there aren't, I never understand any more of what I've seen than the feelings it's left me with. I don't really care. Clowns at the village are seen as teachers, as disciplinarians, and of course they invoke humour. Rick Romancito, who's part Zuni, part Hopi, edits the Taos News, and he's just made a short film set in the Pueblo. Now, he's written about sacred Pueblo clowns, albeit in the broadest possible terms. There's lots of things he's not prepared to discuss, like how the clowns are selected, you know, whether it's a job that you're chosen for or is it passed on and how the routines are worked out. But he did agree that part of the clown's function was to preserve the moral integrity of the community. They show by example how not to behave. And in your article about that, you used the phrase sacred disciplinarians. Mm -hmm. That's quite an interesting juxtaposition of ideas. I wonder if you'd be prepared to elaborate on that. Well, um, they do this in a couple of different ways. Uh, one is in that they uh, punish inappropriate behavior. Like, for instance, if uh, children are, are behaving naughty, the clowns will literally pick them up and, and take them over to the river and toss them in. I saw that happen a lot yesterday. Right? Yeah, but, it's, but it's, not, it's not actually uh, viewed as, as punishment. It's viewed as a blessing in the hopes that the water from the river will... Um, uh, enable them to live a, a, a cleaner, more fruitful and beneficial life. They even will take the opportunity to ridicule prominent members of the community, um, tribal leaders, anybody might be a target. So this is what was going on when the guys were brought into the ring at the end and dressed up as women and they brought out these two seven-foot guys that were obviously identifiable members of the community as being the giant man and a, a very beautiful girl was made to walk around in different sized shoes that gave her some well, difficulty. Well, I, I, I didn't see that part right. of it, but I, I'll, I'll have to take your word on that. Okay. <laughs> By doing these kinds of things, it's, it's in, in a way kind of a catharsis because uh, tribal life 
kind of emphasizes a democratic outlook that no one person should consider themselves greater than another. It's sort of taking people down a notch a little. <laughs> there was a lot of um, interaction with, well, what you call the Anglos here, getting uh, any guys in cowboy hats to like have uh, little gunfights with each other, which was very. They've, they've done this for for many, many, many mm. years. Um, but I will tell you that a long time ago, in, in probably the 1800s or so, the clowns were ten times worse than what you see now. Their antics uh, m might be considered nowadays to be X-rated. When, when you talk about the phrase sacred clown, it's almost like a light bulb coming up, up above my head and going, oh yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I, I do stand-up comedy myself, so obviously it's very, it's very flattering, the idea that you could somehow, <laughs> be, as, somehow be sacred <laughs> would be... Uh, would be great. I'm not, you know, not well, sure. Well, but you're just a man out of time, that's all it is. Is that what it is? <laughs> <laughs> the American stand-up comedian George Carlin said that shock is just an uptown word for surprise. In a time when people feel like they have the right not to be offended, and government appears to pander to this notion, it's worth remembering that shock and surprise are often indivisible and are essential tools of comedy. After my ten-year wait, Seeing the Pueblo clowns and the response of their gleefully liberated audience in the little social space between the white adobe church, the sparkling river and the sharply rising houses reminded me in no uncertain terms of what comedy is for. Evidently the Pueblo clowns think that shock has a social, moral purpose. Thankfully, they're still not quite alone. As a clown, do you feel you have a duty to offend? Oh God, yeah. <laughs> especially as especially as my character uh, when you can get somebody who really is confronted with something that is uncomfortable and they're forced to confront it it allows people to look at themselves and then not be so upset about it the next time it happens right but is the world ready for a clown character based on the prophet muhammad do you think i that's a good idea would you be the great first idea <laughs> <laughs> we should have like Mohammed and every religious icon, you know, Buddha the clown. Of course, he's already a clown. I make it my point to offend everyone. <laughs> I do not discriminate between sexual orientation or religion. <laughs> You're an equal, equal opportunities offender. You, yeah, you. I am equal opportunity offender, and I pride myself on that. Last week I went to Towers Pueblo and saw a Pueblo clown ritual where the values of the village were temporarily overturned and all its fears were exposed. I concluded that the Pueblo clowns represented the pure heart of what clowning and all comedy in general could and possibly should be about. But I'm not convinced that there are any modern clowns close to home that have the same sense of purpose. The clandestine insurgent rebel clown army or circa would disagree. They first came to public attention after launching giant pink pretzels through a cannon during President Bush's visit to the UK in 2003, and they'd become a regular fixture of the global protest movement. What's over there? Israel! What's next to Israel? Palestine! What's in Palestine? The Israelis! What's in the Israelis? Circa says it aims to make clowning dangerous again, to bring it back to the street, restore its disobedience, and give it back the powers it once had to disrupt, critique, and heal society. They maintain that the trickster figures of myth and legend always embrace life's paradoxes, creating coherence through confusion, adding disorder to the world in order to expose its lies and speak the truth. Ought not clowns to continue this tradition? I mean, as a protester, mostly one's audience tend to be the police rather than anybody else because they tend to be between you and everything else that's going on. They just sort of... well, but they there was are, something yeah. about kind of like rehumanizing them, making them on the same level as me. And there was a beautiful moment actually with Zoe where we'd been sectioned in by the police. I had already been up to this, well, my clown had already been up to this policeman and gone, oh, hello, I think you just got the loveliest blue eyes. I, I, I like a man in uniform, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and he was just so embarrassed because obviously all his mates are looking at him and giggling. <laughs> when you get ringed in by the police or hemmed in, do you feel like it's kind of created a performance space? Yeah, it's kind of boring actually being contained, you know, because we're not about performance. Mm. It's, no. it, that's not what it's no. for. It's actually to change the world. That's what mm. the whole point is. You know, I have a shaved head and all these earrings. 
so the makeup had to cover my whole head so I wanted to be all white mm -hmm. like a you know just clown white ghosty white Based in LA, Michael Perrick, alias Fucko, is another clown who feels he has a purpose other than simply to entertain. He confronts and assaults his audience. One of the taboos in clown makeup is sharp lines. Because sharp lines are supposed to be scary. So I made my eyebrows blocks, very sharp, just blocks. And the other thing is that no black outlining. It's pretty much outlawed in circus clowning because again, it's scary. So all my makeup, my mouth, and my eyebrows are heavy black outlines. <laughs> so even within the world of clowns, you feel obliged to confront the taboos of clowning. Oh yes, yeah. definitely. The, the, the clown wears the smallest mask in the world, which is their nose. And mm -hmm. that can even just be painted on, it doesn't... In fact, you don't even need the nose, it's no. all in the eyes. Yeah. That's yes. one of the key yes. things it's about the eyes. eyes. It's about looking people in the eyes, and it's about making that connection on a much deeper level than you're able to through words, or even sometimes through touch, or whatever, mm. it's just straight. Well, that's really interesting, because when we were in Towers Pueblo, I found instinctively that I couldn't, I de deliberately tried to not make eye contact with the clowns. So mm. I thought if they, if they made eye contact with me, I would be targeted. <laughs> you can hear the rain falling down. I'm on the corner of uh, Haggerston Road in a little square in Hackney in East London uh, at the All Saints Community Centre, which looks pretty normal from outside, but houses the headquarters of Clowns International and the Clown Gallery and Museum, so we'll go in out of the rain. And um, we've come in out of that uh, rainy square in Hackney into this amazing room. Uh, your spirits, you feel like you, you lift as you come in here. Um, there are full-size mannequins of clowns through the ages. There's all these display cabinets of um, different clown ephemera, statues of clowns. There are a huge collection of posters. There's a fantastic um, tiny clown car, one that... I hope has been diffused because they have a tendency to explode, as we know. There are collections of photographs of clowns through the ages, puppets of clowns, all sorts of circus props. Then all along the walls, these amazing collections of eggs painted with the faces of different clowns, which serve as a kind of record uh, of, of all the different ways that you can make up a clown face. It's an, it's an incredible room to walk into. Um, in this community centre, in this little square, you wouldn't imagine it could be here. I'm meeting two clowns, Ginger Nut and Matty, but in their human guises of Ian Tom and Matty Faint. Well, <laughs> there was an even larger collection than yeah, this. Yeah, obviously. The rest are gone. Well, or they're the the famously broken. fragile eggs. The whole reason you wear makeup is to be seen at a distance. Right. Uh, in, the, in the ring. Also, in, in, also, not, it's then not a mask. Yeah. It's a, it's a living, moving thing, which mm. your face is. It's, mm. it's not a mask to hide behind, it's a window to look through. A window to look That's through. That's beautifully yeah. said. Uh, it is. And that's another thing. <laughs> that a lot of well, we don't hide behind <laughs> no. the makeup. Uh, the reason why say a clown like Ronald McDonald doesn't carry terribly well is that the Ronald McDonald concept was done as a flat drawing first, as an advertising cartoon, and then they transferred that flat cartoon onto a human face, which is obviously not flat. Yeah, it's sort of reverse engineered. So it, mm. It's reverse mm. engineering, and it doesn't always work on, on some of the faces of the people that they have doing Ronald. The word clown comes into the British theatrical tradition with the Renaissance, with the first, therefore, professional theatrical entertainment. Jackie Bratton is the author of The Victorian Clown, and she makes a case for the importance and the transgressive lawless nature of early clowning, and reminds us that whatever we think of clowns today, the craft has real, deep and disruptive roots. He is a kind of loose cannon within that, because very often in a Renaissance text, you'll find that there is a page that says, the clowns enter here, or the cl enter clown, and no words. He makes it up for himself. He does his own act in the middle of the play by Marlowe or whoever it is. Um, Shakespeare took to writing the clowns in so that you get the, the, the fool in Lear, um, Feste in Twelfth Night. Um, and they're called clown, apparently, initially, because that is a word for country booby 
rustic, unsophisticated person. And that is comical, that is to be laughed at. And that was what they did, they did crudely physical things. But of course, as they get built into the plays, it becomes clear that some of them at least are not just able to dance and, and, and run about, sort of blubbering their lips and so forth. Um, they tell jokes. So the whole of, of the theatrical tradition of stand-up comedy, of um, all sorts of comic sketches and so forth, is there in embryo in the professional entertainer who is made part of the first professional theatre companies. The 16th century Commedia dell'arte were, as far as we know, the first troupe to perform solely as clowns. They had a repertoire of specific characters, of Harlequin, Pulcinella, and established the template of the clown in European popular culture, and this was subsequently adapted and mutated by the many hands that inherited it into more recognisably modern clown archetypes, such as the Piero, the Auguste, the Stooge. By the 18th century, there are thriving clown traditions that are not happening within the theatre but are happening in the fairgrounds. There would be clowns fooling about, just playing physical tricks, slapstick. And that becomes a very British figure. He's called things like Jack Pudding. His characteristic laughable feature is his physicality, really. He is the slave of appetite, mostly greed, but also sex. He just does rude things of one sort or another. He is, he's the embodiment of body, if you like, as opposed to mind. And when that gets onto the, the stage, which reckons itself to be moral and uplifting and, and instructional, it's always a bit mm, iffy. Um, the, the presence of the, the fairground clown or the circus clown on the stage at Drury Lane always creates a kind of outburst of critical protest. What on earth have we come to? There's classic boards invaded by the, the clown. The, the edginess of the clown's presence on the legitimate stage doing pantomime at Drury Lane, um, intervening in theatrical entertainment meant for an adult audience. The theatre is, is not a terribly safe place. You go there if you're robust enough to be challenged and intelligent enough to think that's entertaining. And you might get laughed at, and you might get your pocket picked, and you might find you're sitting next to somebody you wouldn't wish to sit next to, a tradesman who's somehow or other got a cheap ticket, come in at half price, or, heaven forfend, a lady of the night, because there was a strong link between organised prostitution and the theatres of London right up to the 1830s, 1840s. Michael Perrick started out as a clown in a troupe called Cacophony in Los Angeles, and this clown collective might be evidence of a wider trend of back-to-basics clowning with their shocking clown sex parties and unauthorised office space entertainments. Michael feels compelled to bring inappropriate comic ideas into areas where they're not welcome. The uh, LA Cacophony is a group of just people who get together and do whacked out things, mm -hmm. and it was all about poking a, people in the ribs. Right. Um, what, what were some examples of stuff that you'd done kind of collectively with that? Oh, uh, well, it started off uh, by putting covering our cars in mud and driving around Beverly Hills. For right. some reason, people really were upset about that. <laughs> yeah. uh, putting uh, stat dog statues in, in the dog park yeah. with weird plaques on it. and uh, <laughs> People got very upset with that, too. Well, what sort of things were on the plaques, then? It just said, statues? for all the dogs that died in Hiroshima <laughs> and Nagasaki. And it turned into this like big news article. I mean, just it turned into such a hoopla. Somebody actually was quoted saying, I come to the park with my dog, and this is a political statement. My dog should not be subjected to such leftist political statements such as this. Yeah. You know, it's just like, oh. Are there things that you personally wanted to do that you can't, that you're able to do as the clown character? Oh, uh, I would say most everything. So <laughs> there's a situation where you thought, I really wish I could have done this here, and you haven't been able to, and you've gone back as the clown and done it. Yeah. There are there are a lot of things. You have amazing the makeup, the costume gives you amazing freedom. You can get on your hands and knees and go around sniffing people's butts. You can go up to a girl and put your hand in her crotch and say, "Hey, baby, can I take your temperature?" Mm. And she's gonna go, "Oh!" <laughs> uh, 
Whereas if you were a regular in regular dress, she'd beat the shit out of you, mm-hmm. you know. So I've walked up to police officers and said, hey, pig boy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and they're just like laughing. So what, what is it about the makeup and the costume that legitimizes that then, do you think? Because it takes you out of society. Mm. It takes you out of being a person doing it and being a character doing it. And that character is in a sense entertainment that character is not necessarily responsible for the actions of the person doing it because it's a character i've actually found it quite liberating to in parody and in character as clown sort of indulge that greed and the the hunger for power and my clown wants to be the center of attention the difference for me as a sort of protester i guess is between normally when asked who's in charge everyone goes oh well, no one's in charge and you know, oh, we're autonomous, it's all horizontal. You ask a bunch of clowns who's in charge, they're all Me, in charge. I'm, I'm, in, charge. I'm in charge. And so is my wife. Yes. yes. <laughs> so are the things that have come out of, out of doing the clowning that have changed the way you behave in everyday life, or don't you see the separation anymore? <laughs> <laughs> is it too late for you to go back? Oh, yes. <laughs> it's true, it's, it's transformative. It is, it is transformative, yeah. 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 As, as in blessed, you know, I mean, the silly sheep in the Bible and all that. It's a, it's a blessed state as well. Blessed? Well, a blessed what, like a sacred clown? Yeah, I, mm. I think it goes that way. Yeah. yeah. If you spell sacred in a different way, it's scared. Yeah. yeah. Which or scarred. Yeah, yeah. Scarred. yeah. All these things. Mm. They're like that. <laughs> Most religions have their fools, their fool figures. Because of that whole thing about the fool doesn't look as though he's wise, but is and has great powers. I mean, lots of religions have got this idea of the fool is the messenger between man and the gods, whatever those gods may be. Mm. Um, So clowns used to be revered. I mean, even the village idiot used to be revered. He's not now. He's locked away. I think part of the problem of today's religions is that they take themselves so seriously that we lose the fool figure and therefore lose the point of faith. I mean, I think people coming to faith, it's like getting the joke, really. You have to allow them to, to get the joke for themselves. Have there been times when, despite the kind of protective aura of makeup and costume, uh, you have ended up in trouble? Um, actually, yeah, only once. Uh, there was a there was a man who was obviously very afraid of clowns, and um, I was bothering him, and he ran away. But he came back later and started punching me and he actually physically assaulted me several people had to pull him off because I had forced him to confront a fear he got very angry you come across a lot of people who are terrified of clowns but most of them have the fear reaction and run away very few people actually have the um, the violent reaction are people frightened of clowns because there's been 50 years of horror films in which uh, you know a, a, the, there's a clown murder or a clown doll gets or right. gets possessed or are they afraid of clowns because they're afraid that you're going to reveal something about them that's part of it it's the character it's the makeup it's not being able to see the person's real face and earlier on over there I saw you were talking about slapstick whilst holding a stick with slap written on it. Yes. What's, what, what is the slapstick? Well, it's uh, basically two strips of wood separated by a third piece of wood and when, when pressed together... Oh, well, then... Oh, we'll hear it now. Here it is, here it is, here it is. A slapstick. It's kind of like two skis, isn't it? Yeah. Two skis pressed together it, and then it kind skis. of snaps. And, um... Uh, originally formed in in the days of the Commedia, uh, two people would have this on stage, and sorry, <laughs> <laughs> everybody's just jumped out of their radio oh, no, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but actually, all the images of clowns that you see, there's always people hitting each other with stuff, whether it's bladders on sticks. Yes. Or, I mean, in the again in the Pueblo clowns, there tended to be huge phalluses. They would be bashing each other with, yeah. Which oh, I've never done that. No, well, you wouldn't be appropriate. <laughs> no, not no. really. No. You've got this big sort of colourful phallic thing coming out of you with all kind of clown coloured rags tied around it and uh, a kind of red stripy end to it So, th- th- and this this sort of image turns up in the kind of anthropology of clowning going back thousands of years, this giant phallic thing was 
you know, I like this whole idea of a large phallus that mm. you can just you can you poke people with, and but then I wanted something that was soft so I could whack them over the head with it and they wouldn't scream, and 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 then when I was thinking about it, it is something that is used a lot. You know, the, a lot of comedy and a lot of a lot of that clown care a lot of those clown characters have always had the the type of bopper type of thing and yeah. we started work on a on an actual um, uh, an actual inflatable phallus that would come out of my pants oh, and right. and spit fireworks we would inflate this thing that would go out to about 4 feet and we wanted it to look like a giant american flag oh, so that yeah. people would salute it right oh, that's <laughs> idea isn't it <laughs> In the 19th century, the clown became a chief attraction in the newly invented circus, as well as being a common and unpredictable feature of entertainment in the theatre. But in the Victorian age, the demands of the modern marketplace began to reshape the role of the clown. Jackie Bratton. The attempt to make the theatre respectable, to match its audience, very firmly locks out improvised entertainment for a start. The manager really wants to know what's going to be said on his stage. He really wants to know that nobody in the boxes is suddenly going to take exception to something that happens in the pantomime. During the early decades of the 19th century, when the great clown was Joe Grimaldi, somebody at Drury Lane, having failed to hire Grimaldi, thought, oh, well, there are, there's another clown at Settlers Wells. have him. His name is Bradbury. So this Bradbury guy comes down from Sadler's Wells, but actually previous to that from the circus, he is expected to do topical humour. And the topical humour that's been picked on for this particular pantomime is about gentlemen whips. Young men with a great deal more money than sense um, who dress themselves up as coachmen and drive very far through the countryside with male coaches or with their own um, little equipages and it, it's the kind of equivalent of, of modern young men and, and Porsches really and they dress themselves up in these ludicrous costumes to do it the Bradby comes on wearing one of these costumes carrying a whip and making silly jokes and it goes down like a lead balloon because of course the, the gentlemen in the boxes do this sort of thing it's sat up aimed very personally at them and what happens on about the third or fourth night of the pantomime is that a man stands up, a major somebody or other, stands up in one of the boxes and says, I object to this. What he actually claims he is objecting to is the introduction of some news story not connected, not at all connected with the whip craze into the pantomime, some other news story. And the clown enlists the rest of the house and the cast to send him up. And there is a complete furore and scandal about this. Not only is Bradbury sacked, but the whole pantomime is taken off and a new one is rehearsed, and, and which doesn't include satire on the whips. Lots of words can be magical. Judah. Alakazam, yes, that's a good one. Good Alakazam. Do any more? Need some more? Need three. Three magic words. <laughs> Cadabra, that's a nice religious one, thank you. Where did you get the the basic kind of shape of your clown drum? Is it based on a person that you know or yourself or it's based on me. Yeah. I mean it has to be based on me. Any clown must be based but in the end if you're gonna be a truth teller, you have to be truthful to yourself to have any integrity and to speak of truth at all. So it's it's from me. I think anyone who wants to be a clown has to find those probably fairly absurd bits of themselves and that's where you start from basically the character is my father you, your clown is based on your father yeah my father's from the bronx you know big guy yeah. genius but just really gruff and hey get out of my face you know sort of guy that's really interesting what you're saying about your father because um my father said a lot of uh incredibly inappropriate, uh, politically incorrect things at entirely the wrong time. Yeah. And I've often tried to to sort of talk about them on stage as a stand-up, but the actual sentences that he said are so utterly unacceptable. There's no way of doing it without people just assuming you are actually a racist. But he is, 
he's an authority figure, but you've you've dressed as him and have you've used the sort of things he would say uh-huh. in um, in public situations where they suddenly become funny rather than threatening or embarrassing. Is that you know? It's like you've defeated that memory. Uh, yeah, oh, exactly. Uh, it's actually rather funny because my my girlfriend actually does not like the character. But she's, there, were, she, there were photos of her interacting she's with you with it. As a, in a fairly intimate way during she's the clown performed. sex party. Yeah. She's obviously not that uncomfortable with it. Well, um, she has become very uncomfortable because uh, the character of the clown is not necessarily someone who she wants to be sleeping with. <laughs> it's your father. Exactly. A whole another can of worms. Oh isn't it? god! Cause it'd just be terrible. My old, my ex girlfriends used to say, "Um, your your dad's trying to look up my skirt," and I'm like, "Yeah, I I know." <laughs> he no, does that, really, you know. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting. You did that as the as the clown. Is it? Want to hear something funny? When I when I did my clown character around my dad, he freaked out. He had an absolute panic attack. He wouldn't let me near him. He started to laugh, and then he got uncomfortable, and the next thing I know, he was in his car driving away. He drove away from he you. He drove away from <laughs> right, me. Right. Michael Perrick's clowning provokes strong reactions and sometimes hasty exits. When clowns are in conflict with established ideas, accepted truths, or even, in more literal terms, with the hired hands of government, it seems that they're still protected by our almost subconscious respect for the power of the clown. You're aware, presumably, on some level, that it's going to look really bad in the papers if there's film of police attacking clowns. I mean, they almost come from a kind of PR angle. They have to get away. That's just It's just profoundly upsetting to see a clown being hurt. I, I have to admit, having recently been arrested in clown, that it, it was unfortunate for the arresting officers because as they took me into the police station, each police station we kept being transferred, um, all their colleagues cracked up laughing and they became <laughs> laughing stuff with their colleagues. Yeah. It was a really lovely moment actually when I'm, we walked in and for some reason I was walking up the stairs first to the front desk and I walked in and, the, and I was just like, oh, okay I've got some police officers here for you. <laughs> so the policeman at the front desk and the, their faces were just the absolute picture because they were just like, it was a moment that was just so confused. <laughs> it was great. Last week, when I travelled to New Mexico, I began to understand the idea that clowning, the ancient template of comedy in its most pure form, could mean something rather more than it might first appear to. Clowning could create confusion and chaos and cause questions to be asked that could maintain or undermine the societies it served. And here at home too, beneath the masks of the clowns we grew up watching, you can still see traces of what has been lost. But after a round trip of 16,000 miles, I realised that as well as embodying profound and important qualities, clowning is also about something else, something you don't need to travel the world to discover, and something we all overlook at our peril. It's as plain as a red nose on a white face. Laughter is an amazing thing, but it's something that we can't do on our own. And um, I've always felt the clown is the catalyst, because you're actually finding a way to make that person laugh and it's, it's such a magical thing to do you know uh, Charlie Chaplin said that laughter is the closest distance between two people a day without laughter is a day wasted if you laugh y- y- your soul is lifted and the lighter your soul the happier you are in life mm-hmm.